Father, thank you that you teach us to pray. Thank you that you invite us to ask. Over and over again in Scripture, you, you just say, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. you. You said, call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things that we don't even begin to know. Thank you for the invitation to pray. And as the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. In your name we ask this. Amen. Well, I would imagine that uh, almost every one of you here this morning has been to a, a movie that has been shown in 3D. What, what does 3D mean? Third dimensional, three dimensions, okay? So there's height, there's depth, there's width or, or breadth or whatever you want to call it. Uh, three dimensions. But there's also a fourth dimension that science talk about. And although uh, they're not in total agreement, most scientists talk about the fourth dimension as being length of time. And then there's the fifth dimension. And I'm not talking about the popular singing group in the 60s and 70s. Love that group. But I'm really talking about the work of some German scientists back in the 1920s where they were trying to rectify or unify the four fundamental uh, sources of power in the universe. <coughs> that which they call the strong nuclear forces, weak nuclear forces, gravity, and electromagnetism. And they even came up with this mathematical formula. Unfortunately, the fifth dimension is not visibly demonstrable. You, you can't see it. And not only that, it doesn't have anything to do with your life, okay? So aren't you glad for that? I don't have to worry about, you know, some kind of, of crazy thing. But I want us to talk today about praying in the five dimensions of prayer. Because it's important that we learn how to pray in all the ways in which God would, would have us pray. Um, and we're going to look at that today, but there's a couple of truths that we need to look at, first of all. And number one is we need to understand that God is a multidimensional God. God is a multidimensional God. That is, he's not just one dimension. He's not just two dimensions. He's not three dimensions. You can't go and watch a 3D movie of God, okay? Um, and, and I say that because God is a multidimensional God because... And, 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 Folks, this is the most important thing that I can teach you because your fulfillment in prayer, your fruitfulness in, in prayer really depends on how much you know about God. And the more you know about God, the better your prayers are going to be, uh, the more effective they're going to be, the more satisfying they're going to be. So in this campaign, we're not learning all about prayer, although learning about prayer is important. But more critical is learning about the God to whom we pray. See, the more you know about God, the better your prayer life is going to be. Uh, and so we need to understand that, uh, that God is a multidimensional God. Now, what do I mean by that? <coughs> well, I mean that he's not just one dimension. And, and we're going to see that in many things. First of all, we see it in the fact that we see it in God's creation. We see the multidimensional nature of God in his creation. Obviously... When you look at our multidimensional universe and world, you come to understand that this was created by a God of great diversity, great complexity, uh, really a, a, a multidimensional creator. Uh, and there are many things that we can see in our world that really speak of the complexity of this world. And if the world is complex, how much even more complex is God? Over in Job chapter 11, uh, Job is complaining about his life. And um, he's complaining about all that's happening in his life. And one of his friends reminds him that um, God is in control. God is in charge. In, in Job 11, verse 7 through 9, he's, his, his friend asks him, Can you discover the limits and the bounds of the greatness and power of God? Well, the obvious answer is no. Then look what it says. The sky is no limit for God. Now, did you catch that? We say, oh, the sky is the limit. The Bible tells us the sky is no limit for God. Um, but it lies beyond your reach. God knows the world of the dead, 
but you do not know it. In other words, there's a whole dimension uh, that we don't even know about, but God knows about. He says, God's greatness is broader than the earth, wider than the sea. So we understand that God is multidimensional by looking at our universe, the created world around us. Uh, that's one way in which we understand the multidimensional nature of God. But there's another way, and that is in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We see God's uh, multi, boy, I'm getting this, multidimensional nature in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And that means that God came to earth and became human. That's what incarnation means. It's just God became flesh. The Word became flesh. Look at John uh, 1, 14. It says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The fact that God can be God and come to earth and God can be human really speaks of his multidimensional nature. Think about it. If God wanted to communicate with an ant, he would have become an ant, right? If he wanted to communicate with cows, he would have become a cow. But he wanted to communicate with humans. And so he became human. That's multidimensional. And so the proof is found in Jesus Christ, the fact of Jesus Christ. The Bible says this about Jesus, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you know anybody like that? I mean, are you the same forever? No, you're not even the same you were last week. You've lost a few hairs, you've added a few wrinkles, maybe you've gained a few pounds, maybe you've lost a few pounds. You're not going to be the same forever. But here's what this saying, that, that Jesus is neither bound by space or time. Uh, why? Because he's God. He's multidimensional. Another thing the Bible tells us about Genesis, uh, about Jesus out of uh, Revelation, Revelation 1-4 says, Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. That includes everything. Well, that certainly isn't describing you and me, is it? I mean, it's not like you were and you are and you will be. No, Jesus is multidimensional. God the Father is multidimensional. And then we actually see God's nature in the Holy Spirit. We see that God is multidimensional when you see how the Holy Spirit moves. Jesus talking in John 3 and verse 8 <coughs> says, The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you cannot explain how people are born of the Spirit. So Jesus is saying this. He says, you can't put the Holy Spirit in a box. You can't control him. He's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. You just hear the sound of it. And so the Holy Spirit moves in multidimensional ways that, that we don't move in. Uh, you, you can't see the Holy Spirit. So clearly, that's a dimension that we don't see, that we cannot comprehend, we're not acquainted with. So Jesus is saying is that the Holy Spirit is multidimensional. So think about it, here in the whole Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we see the multidimensional nature of God. But there's a second point to this, and this is even more important, and that is because God is multidimensional, I am never alone. I am never, never alone. I mean, he's in the past, he's in the present, he's in the future, he is here, he is there, uh, he's on, you know, in heaven, he's on earth, he's in the spirit world, he's in your world, he's in my world, he's everywhere. And, and you know, he's above you, he's in you, he's around you, because he's multidimensional. Now, I'm not talking about a bunch of gods. I'm talking about one God but three different multidimensional persons in the Godhood. And so I am never alone. David said this in Psalm 139, beginning of verse 7. He says, I can never escape from your presence. I can never get away from your presence, from your spirit. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell on the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me, your strength will will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me become dark. But even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. 
To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Uh, here's a little tip I think that David is, is giving to us. Never try to play hide and seek with God. Because anywhere you go to try to hide, he's already been there, okay? Uh, you know, we're talking about the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere. So that means that no place that you've ever been, no place that you are, no place that you will ever be, will be a place where God is not. He's, he's present. Uh, that ought to encourage you. Because that means that as you go into the future, there is no place that you're going to go that God's not going to be with you. Isn't that a tremendous statement, a tremendous thought? God is totally with you. Now, what does this have to do with prayer? Well, it has a lot to do with prayer. I mean, because God is everywhere. He's in the past, the present, the future. He's in every dimension of the world, and even in dimensions that we don't know about. And so because he's everywhere and in every dimension, you can talk with him about every dimension of your life, about everything that's going on in your life. And he already understands it because he's there. Now, I want to get practical. I mean, because God is a multidimensional God, um, you don't want to learn just one dimension praying, okay? So let's talk about five dimensions of prayer, how you can pray in five dimensions. Uh, the first dimension when I pray, I look backward to the cross. I look backward to the cross. In, in other words, instead of starting your prayers by talking about the problems you're facing today and the fears that you have of tomorrow, instead look back to the cross and recall what God has done for you in the cross of Jesus Christ. Start your prayers with the cross because what that does is that begins your prayers with an attitude of gratitude. It begins with, with a, a, a moment of thanksgiving because of what God has done for you in the past. You know, when I think about Christ dying for me on the cross, it instantly reminds me of, of three things, and they're there in your notes. It reminds me of how deeply God loves me. It reminds me of how costly evil and sin is and how completely I'm forgiven. That's a great place to start in prayer. To, to really think about how much God loves me and how, much, how though even my sins were such a mess that God through Jesus Christ has now completely forgiven me. And so I look backward to the cross. Peter writing in 1 Peter 1 verse 18 says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. I have at my home a first edition copy of the book For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. Do you want to know how much that book is worth? Well, if I were to tell you what, it's, what I see it advertised on the Internet, it is somewhere between seven and $800. But do you want to know how much it really is worth? It is worth only what a person will pay me for it. If somebody will not give me $700 for it, it's not worth $700. If they won't even buy it, it's not worth anything, right? So how much are you worth? You're worth what somebody is willing to pay for you. Well, what did Jesus Christ do? He showed you how worthy you are, how much you're worth by dying for you. That's how, worth, how much you're worth. Look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Here's God, and he sent his son to this earth to die for you. The son of God became the son of man so that the sons of man might become sons of God. That's, that's how much you're worth. He did what we could not do for ourselves. Uh, you couldn't pay for all the wrong things that you did. Neither could I. And so God says, I love you, and so I'll do it. That shows how much you're worth. He gave his own self, his own life for you. And so when I pray, the first thing I do is I think about how much Jesus Christ loves me and how much he paid for me. I look back at the cross. That's a good way to start your prayer. And by the way, one of the ways that you could really enhance your quiet time is uh, by listening to songs about the cross. 
or reading the lyrics of songs about the cross. You know, somebody says, that cross was way long ago. Well, what you ought to do is get some music that will remind you of the cross, that will help you to, to rejoice in the cross. So every, your quiet time in the morning doesn't just need a, a prayer list. You ought to have a playlist of songs that you can play and, and listen to as well. <laughs> so think about this as well. Right now, all the sins that you've committed, they're in the past, right? And the cross is in the past. And because of that, those things are forgiven. But remember, Jesus Christ is multidimensional. And that's a big deal. I mean, you're going to go into the future. And I know you're, you're, you're saying, I'm not going to sin in the future. We know we're, none of us are perfect. So we're going, to, we're going to mess up in the future. Well, Jesus is already there. His forgiveness is already there. The cross is already paid for the sins, past and present and future. He solved the problem that we have even before we had the problem. That's what it means to, to, for, of, of Jesus Christ paying the debt for us. So that's the first dimension. I look backward to the cross. That's, that's the first dimension. The second dimension is then I look upward into the face of a loving father. I look upward into the face of a loving father. That's the second thing I do when I pray. I start by looking at the cross, and then I shift my focus from the past to look upward to my heavenly father's face. And we need to focus on the fact that God wants us to see him not as a dictator, not as your boss, not as your supervisor. Uh, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. You should call God Father. Father. Now, you and I need to realize this was a radical thing for Jesus to tell his disciples who were Jews, Jewish people, that God was to be addressed as Father because nowhere in the Old Testament will you ever hear anybody praying to God as Father. They talked to him as Yahweh, as Adonai, or, or Lord. They called him the Majestic One. They called him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Sometimes they prayed to him as the Creator. But nowhere did they ever pray and say, God, as, talk to God as Father. So when Jesus said this, this was radical. God, Jesus says, God wants you to call him Father. Think about your own prayers. When you pray, how do you address God? Some of us say, well, now, Lord, blah, blah, blah. Some of us say, dear God, whatever. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Let's make it more personal. Call him your father. You know, I, I get on pet peeves about prayer. <clears throat> Let me give you another pet peeve, okay? Have you ever listened to yourself pray? Some of us use God's name like punctuation marks in our prayer. Oh, dear God, Aunt Sally really needs you, God. And God, would you take care of her needs today? And, and Lord, would you uh, give her this? And, and God, would you take care of that? And God, they need this. And God, they need that. Folks, we don't talk like that, do we? I mean, prayer is to be a conversation. You know, uh, Monica... I wouldn't say to you, hey, Monica, I really enjoyed talking to you the other day, and Monica, uh, I need this, and Monica, would you do that? And Monica, hey, Monica, would you do this? And Monica, would you do that? We don't talk like that. Why do we talk to God like that? In other words, just say, Father, and then tell him what you need to tell him. So think, listen to your prayers. Think through your prayers. Um, so here's what I want you to do this week, okay? Um, I want you to start calling God Father in your prayers. I mean, intentionally do that. You're, you're going to pray and just stop and think, okay, Father. Now, why do we want to do that? Because that's what God wants us to call him. Well, you say, well, you know, my father wasn't very good. And I have trouble calling God Father. Well, can I just simply say that God is not your father? And your father's not God? See, God is a perfect Father. He's a God who cares. He's a God who is competent. He's a God who is consistent. He's a God who's capable. He's a, he's a God who is close to us. Every human Father is imperfect, but our Heavenly Father is not. He is a perfect, loving Father. And He says, 
I want you to call me Father. So when, when Jesus said, I want you to start every prayer, our Father, he was serious. <clears throat> He's serious about that. And so this week, instead of saying, now Lord, or dear God, I want you to say, now Father, or dear Father. Remember, how you see God controls your life more than anything else in your life. And the way you see God will determine whether the prayers you pray are fruitful and fulfilling or, or not. So it's, it's how you see God. And Jesus says, pray our Father. And he means that, okay? So if you, want to make, if you only make one change out of this whole 40 days, if you only make one change in your prayer life, if you would simply start calling God Father, it would make a huge difference in how you, approach, how you approach God. It would radically change your life because how you address a person sets the tone for the whole conversation. And I think too many of us, you know, when we pray, we act like we're going to the bank for a loan and God's the loan officer, you know. Or we're giving a, a, a deposition to an attorney and we're so terrified we're going to say the wrong thing or that uh, we're taking a lie detector test with the FBI, you know. That's how we feel about we're approaching God. How you approach God, how you think of God, how you see God really determines how much you enjoy prayer. He's your Father and He loves you. And, and so <clears throat> I want to just encourage you, Start building into your mind, God is my Father. Um, in fact, he's not just your Father. If you really dig down in what the New Testament talks about, he's more of our Daddy. He's our Papa. I mean, Jesus used that term, Abba. Uh, and look over in Romans chapter 8. God's Word tells us this in Romans 8 and verse 15. Um, he says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Now, uh, the Living Bible says this, we should not be like cringing, fearful slaves. This idea that we come into God's presence afraid he's going to whip us again. He's going to beat us again like, a, like a, a, bad, a bad slave. He says, instead, you've rec you received God's spirit when, you ad when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Uh, that's what happened to you when you were saved. God adopted you into his family. You're a part of his family now, and, and you're going to inherit everything because you're, you're, you're an heir of the, of the throne of God. Look at this, verse 17. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to suffer, uh, and, but if we are to share his glory... We must also share his suffering. Friends, this verse is packed with life-changing truths. If I were to ask you to memorize any verse in the Bible, this might be the one that I would ask you to memorize. I know it's a long verse, but when you understand all the truths that are in this verse, it will change your life. It'll change your prayer life. It'll change everything about you. Look what it says. First of all, he says, I am no longer a slave to fear. You shouldn't act like, like fearful slaves. As I said, whatever you think God is like really determines how you pray. And if you think God is a, oh, he's an interesting creator or he's an unpleasable deity or maybe he's a total stranger, then your prayers are going to be a waste of your breath because they're not going to be meaningful to you. This passage here from Romans 8, really gives to us three very important points about prayer that we need to learn, we need to memorize, we need to practice, we need to not forget. Three ways that God wants our prayers to be. <clears throat> if you want your prayers to be the kind of prayers that please God and that God answers, then it needs to have these three things in them. First of all, God wants my prayers to be personal. God wants my prayers to be personal. Look what it says. Abba, Father. Abba means Daddy. That's the best way to do it. Uh, what he's saying is that when it comes down to God, we don't just call him Father because Father's kind of formal. You call him Daddy. Uh, Abba is a very basic root word 
in the Aramaic language. That's the language that Jesus spoke. If you were to go to the Middle East today, they still speak Aramaic there, and you were to see a small boy following his daddy walking down the road, he would probably be saying, Abba, Abba, Abba. And he's saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. It's a word that even the smallest child learns. It's like Dada. That very first words that a baby speaks, or Mama. It's, it's something that's easy to say. Abba, Dada, Daddy. That's what Jesus is saying. This is how you address God. Wow, don't you think that kind of changes your whole concept of prayer? Sometimes this formal thing that the skit guys talked about, you know, it's something very personal. And that's how God wants it to be. You know, this is the most intimate word that you can address God with. And God wants intimacy with you. He created you for intimacy. And so Jesus says, man, when you come into God's presence, your prayer shouldn't be flowery and full of all kinds of great language and, and, and really erudite and, and cool or anything like that. No, he says, when you come, your prayers ought to be simple. They ought to be childlike. They ought to be unpretentious. It's just Abba. It's just Dada. It's just Daddy. If you don't come to God like that, maybe you don't know God. Maybe you just don't know God. Start using those words, Abba or Papa or Daddy or, or, or Father, to refer to your Father in heaven. It's unpretentious. It's unassuming. It's honest. It's childlike. You need to settle this issue, and it will change your prayer life because what you, th what you think about God really sets the tone to how do you pray toward God. And think about it. Every misunderstanding about prayer is really a misunderstanding about God. So here's the homework for this week. I, I want you, and I'm serious about this, okay? I want you this week to start calling God Father. And if you're more adventurous, call him Daddy. Uh, call him Abba. If you want to. You might say, well, <clears throat> I just don't feel comfortable with that. Well, that's your problem, okay? You know, that's why your prayer life sucks. Can I just say that? Because uh, you're not allowing God to be intimate with you. Because you're holding this, this thing out. He's God. He's Lord. He wants you to call him Daddy. Uh, God says, number one, more than anything else, I want your prayer life to be personal. I want it to be personal. I'm your father. So stop talking to me like your boss or your recruiter, okay? Second thing, God wants my prayers to be passionate. He wants my prayers to be passionate. He says, cry out. Uh, he says, when we pray, we cry out, Abba, Father. Uh, the phrase here in Romans 8.15 in the, the New Living Translation, which I've, uh, I have uh, listed there for you, really just simply says these words, now we call him. That's a weak translation, okay? Because the word call there means to shout out, to cry out loud. We simply cry out. I notice that children cry a lot. Have you ever thought of that? Roman, your, your daughter cry a lot? Yeah, and they're not embarrassed to cry in public. Uh, we adults are going to cry in public, you know. But children, you know, they, you're in the grocery store line, and boy, they'll light up the world, you know. Wah! And there they go, you know. Uh, they're totally unpretentious. Are you that way in prayer? Or are we more concerned about what other people will think about our prayers than we are about praying our prayers? God says, I want your prayers to be passionate. Cry out to me. Tell me what's going on in your life, what you need. He says, you know, when you come, it needs to be personal, but it also needs to be passionate. <clears throat> and then the third thing, God wants my prayers to be a partnership. To be a partnership. He wants my prayers to be a partnership with his Holy Spirit. Um, did you know that when you pray, the Holy Spirit prays with you? When you pray, the Holy Spirit prays with you. Um, Every time you pray, God is actually talking to himself about you. That's a funny way to put it, isn't it? But the Holy Spirit prays for you. Uh, Romans 8, 26. <clears throat> 
And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Anyone agree with that statement? Yeah, absolutely. Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. See, the Holy Spirit is begging God on our behalf with deep groanings and, and feelings. And why is that so? Because God is passionate about us. Uh, you know, you may be thinking, well, God, I would really like to have this in my life. And the Holy Spirit is saying, God, he needs it. Give it to him. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Now, okay, what in the world does that mean? I mean, let me cover a few things. First of all, your loving Heavenly Father understands that you often don't know how to pray. That sometimes you don't know what to say. You don't know how to say it. You can't put it into words. <clears throat> and so the Bible says that God joins with you and he talks to himself when, he, when you talk to him. Now you think, well, what, what are you saying? That's weird, Sam. Well, who do you think the Holy Spirit is praying to? He's praying to God. And who is the Holy Spirit? He's God. Okay? So, God prays to God? Have you ever talked to yourself? Sure, we all do that. And sometimes somebody is talking to you, and you're talking to yourself about them. Right? We do that all the time. Because we're made in the image of God. You know, so when you talk to God, the Holy Spirit, who is God, also talks to himself about you. Talk about power in prayer. Do you suppose God answers God's prayers? And he's praying them about you. That's profound, folks. The Holy Spirit is praying for you. Prayers to be a partnership. <clears throat> okay, so that's number three. We're talking about a multidimensional, five-dimension prayer. So I look back at the cross. I pray upward into the face of my loving Heavenly Father. And number three, I look inward. I look inward to Jesus living inside of me. See, the Bible is very plain that the moment that you cross the line, you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ comes in and he takes up residence in your life. God puts his Holy Spirit in you as Jesus is in you. Now, for that matter, and this may shock you, the whole Trinity is in you. If you have Jesus Christ in your heart, you've got the Holy Spirit. And if you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got the, uh, God the Father in you. You know, so the Trinity in, is inside you. In fact, you might want to write in the margin of your notes there, all three in me. All three in me. Because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Um, you know, the Son of God is in you. If you've invited them into your life. Now, if you've never invited Christ into your heart, then none of those are in there, okay? That's what salvation is all about. So I look inward to Jesus Christ living inside of me. Now, since Jesus Christ is in me, and the Father and the Holy Spirit and all that, then I know <clears throat> that I am unconditionally accepted by my Father. And that gives me freedom. It gives me the courage to honestly face up to my faults. This is the third part of prayer, to face my faults. You know, I've turned to, to the cross and then to the Father, and now I'm looking what's inside of me. And I'm saying, Christ, you're in me. But there's stuff in me that are there with you that I don't really like in my life. There are bad attitudes. There, there's uh, some secret sins. There's some compulsions that are there. Uh, there's some fears. There's some hurtful feelings. There's some bad memories that are there. There's some unforgiveness. And, and God, there's some stuff in me that I don't like. And Jesus, you're living in me. Would you help me to do a little house cleaning? get rid of all that stuff in my life. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself. It's talking about self-examination. It's, it's kind of doing a heart checkup. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Is, is your faith real? Is your faith growing? He says, test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. <clears throat> 
That is, you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart. Let me ask you a question. Would anybody here besides me like to be better than they are right now? Yeah, of course we would. That's why you're here. You want to get better in life. You want to be better than you are. Well, I can't get better in my life until I face what needs to be challenged and changed in my life. I've got to face that. Before I can get better, I must admit that I'm bitter, you know. I must admit what's bad in my life. I can't grow until I'm honest. There's not going to be any change in your life without trust. And there's no trust in your life without the truth. So first, I have to be honest. This is the third dimension of prayer. I look inward to Jesus Christ living in me, and then I ask Jesus to, to clean up the stuff in my life, to do a little housekeeping of all the junk that's in my life. Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen. People who conceal their sins will not prosper. I wonder if that's why many of us are not succeeding in life. We're concealing sin in our heart. People who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. That is, they'll get a second chance. You know, the cover-up is always worse than the sin, if you think about it. So if you hide, if you're not open, if you don't do a, a self-examination, if you don't face it, nothing good is going to happen in your life. But if you do confess it, and you reject it, and you receive mercy, and you get another chance. Now, here's a big secret, okay? God already knows what's going on in your life. It's not like, oh, I didn't see that coming. God's never going to say that. God knows what's going on in your life. And he still loves you anyway. And he still uh, wants you to be honest with him. Um, and when, you, when you're honest with God, it takes you to a new level of intimacy with him. Let me, let me pause right there and talk about this. Because if you could learn to be intimate with God, it would impact your intimacy in every other relationship in your life. If you could just be intimate with God. Um, you know, you could be married 50 years and you would not necessarily have to have any intimacy with your wife. Intimacy is not sex, okay? Sex is just the mingling of bodies. Intimacy is the mingling of souls. And, you know, intimacy is, is, happens like, you know, in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve says they were naked and they were not ashamed. That is, there was no cover-up there. There were no masks. There was no faking it. They were who they were, and it was in plain sight, okay? And if you have things in your life that are secrets from your spouse, then you don't have intimacy in, in your marriage. Um, how in the world can you have intimacy if you've got things that are not out in the open um, when you're not honest? So first, you've got to be honest with God, and maybe even before that, you need to be honest with yourself to say, yeah, here's some areas that I need to work on in my life. <clears throat> when you start being honest with God, it takes you to a whole new level of intimacy. Because everybody craves intimacy. Everybody desires intimacy in their life. But there's only one way to get intimacy, and that's by be, being willing to open up, by inviting God to, into looking really into what you think about yourself. Because he already knows, and so it's not going to be any surprise. <clears throat> you see, there are levels of intimacy in life. And uh, if you were to share maybe your frustrations, maybe you do that in a small group, that's one level of intimacy. Um, you know, you can share your fears. That's a deeper level of intimacy. Uh, you can share what you don't like about yourself. That's an even deeper level of intimacy. Um, listen to this. I, I read this this week, and I just thought this was profound. And here's a great way to, def to define intimacy. Intimacy is into me see. Into me see. It's an invitation to look inside of me. Uh, that's how to get intimacy. When you invite somebody in your life and, and you say, okay, warts and all, good and bad, into me see. That, that's where intimacy comes from. Folks, most people never learn what I've just talked about, this, this third level. Um, because we've got pride in our life. 
We don't want to admit that there's difficulties inside of us. And so we never pray this third dimension where you ask God to help us look inside. But what if you wanted to start there? Where would you start? I would start in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You might want to just write that there in the margin of your notes. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. This is a listing of nine spiritual gifts. Uh, it simply says this, The fruit of the Spirit are these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, or gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Man, I'd like all of those things in my life, wouldn't you? Uh, I'd like to be more loving. I'd like to have more joy. I'd like to be more patient. I'd like to, to have greater peace in my life. I'd like to have, be more self-controlled. I mean, there's nothing in this list that I don't want. Because this is a perfect picture of Jesus Christ. You say, Jesus, you're in me. Well, would, would you show me what needs to be changed in my life? And, and would you start producing that kind of fruit in my life? Help me today to be just a little more loving. Help me today to have a little more joy in my life. Let me today be a little more at peace with you. Let me today be more patient in all that I do. See, every day, <clears throat> this could become a godly checklist that you, it, you just check off and saying. This is a picture of Jesus, and would you produce these fruits in my life? So that's the third one. The number four, you know, I did a backward look at the cross. I did an upward look into my Father's eyes. I did an inward look to, for, into Jesus and in my life. And number four, I look around and ask the Holy Spirit to use me. I look around and ask the Holy Spirit to use me. You know what the most dangerous prayer that you can pray are these two words, use me, use me. If you will ask God to use you and you will be serious about it, he will wear you out. I mean, he will. Uh, you just look around at the world and you say, Holy Spirit, show me where you want to use me today. You know, instead of criticizing the world or complaining about the world or judging the world, hey, nothing's ever going to change, or whining about the world, why don't you just say, Holy Spirit, Show me what's wrong and where you could use me to bring, make a difference. That would be a tremendous prayer that you could pray. That's a fourth dimension prayer. Romans 6.13 Give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. God says, I want to use you for my purposes. And there's nothing like being used by God. Man, you're in your niche. You, you're doing what God made you to do. You, you're doing what, what you, why you were born. You know, I was made for this. That's the fourth kind of prayer. <laughs> to say, you, God, use me for what you want to use me. Use me any way you choose. I want to be used by you. Folks, the world is waiting for your contribution. The world is waiting for you to make a difference. And so you need to pray this fourth dimension prayer. God, use me. I don't know where, but use me somewhere. I look around, and when you see a need that's out there, and your abilities, your interests match that, guess what? That's where God wants to use you. So backward to the cross, upward to our Heavenly Father, inward to Jesus Christ living in me, and around me, allowing the Holy Spirit to use me. And then the fifth dimension is this. I look forward to the future in faith. I look forward to the future in faith. This is the point in prayer where you start talking to God about what's going on in your life today or what's going to be happening this week or this month or this year or, you know, this is where you talk about your 10-year plan with God or your 20-year plan with God or your life goal or whatever. You just talk to God. You say, Abba, Daddy, Papa. This is the stuff that God wants to talk to you about. You know, every parent loves to hear their child's dreams about the future. God wants to hear your plans, your thoughts, your ideas. Um, you know, talk to God about your day ahead. Say, God, I've got a busy day today. Father, I've got a busy day today, and I've got 19 things on my list. Would you help me prioritize today. Show me what really matters. What is the most important thing? What are the things that you want me to do? Show me what matters most. <clears throat> Father, help me to make the right decisions today. Give me the energy to do everything that you want me to accomplish. 
I want you to know those are the kinds of prayers that God's going to answer. Because you're putting his glory first. Uh, you can be confident about your future. Look at this last verse there on your notes. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finished on the day when Christ returns. You can go to the bank on this one, folks. You know, I am confident, Paul says, that God who began a good work in you will continue what he started. And here's the key thing. It doesn't depend on you. Who's going to complete the work? Who's going to complete the work? God. God will complete the work. He will continue to, 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 to complete it. He will be faithful until the day he, that Jesus Christ returns. Why? Folks, God doesn't sponsor flops. Okay? He's going he's to complete that. So this is what I call five-dimensional praying. Five different... It's just a fresh approach to praying that you might want to try, that might give some new life to, to your prayer life. I want us to close with just a time of, of prayer. And I'm going to just kind of guide you through this again. And ask that you would just, in prayer, work through these five dimensions. So let's bow our heads and, and uh, close our eyes. And would you just begin by focusing on the amazing fact that Jesus Christ died for you? Look backward at the cross. Let gratitude be in your heart. Jesus didn't leave you to yourself, but he died for you. Spend a few minutes just focusing on the cross. <clears throat> then look upward to your Heavenly Father. Think what it means to be able to call Him Daddy. Then look inward in confession. Jesus, there's stuff in me that I need you to help me clean out. And then as you look outward, speak to the Holy Spirit and say, use me. Use me. Make a difference. And finally, in faith, look toward the future. Say, God, this is happening this week. Would you be with me? Give me strength. Give me wisdom. Forward into the future with God. Father, it's just amazing that you have the capability to hear every thought of prayer by every one of us all at the same time. And yet your focus is on each of us individually as if we were the only person in the world praying. You focused your love on us. May we learn more about you and as a result, we become better prayers. Your name we pray.